right, well, uh, we're at Oak Canyon Nature Center today, and uh, today we're going to be studying uh, the, the different habitats that are uh, found uh, in the Nature Center. We're kind of in uh, Anaheim Hills, which is uh, part of the Santa Ana Mountains, the northern edge of the Santa Ana Mountains. And uh, we will be looking at three specific habitats today. Uh, we're currently uh, in the riparian habitat, and riparian habitats are generally found in canyon bottoms, and they tend to have um, water source, either running surface flowing water or kind of subterranean water. And so uh, here in Oak Canyon, we have uh, a reservoir up uh, above us here that is continually releasing some water. And so this is more of a permanent water source here. Um, and we also, you'll uh, notice the plants around here. Um, uh, we have uh, a large, uh, kind of in a big stand of uh, Coast Live Oaks, uh, which is uh, Quercus agrifolia. And, uh, and then um, we, uh, more into the riparian habitat, we also have uh, some black walnut here, uh, Juglans californica, uh, which is California black walnut. Uh, it does produce an edible um, fruit, uh, much smaller than uh, the kind that you would buy uh, in the store, but it does have uh, an edible fruit to it. Uh, down below us here, uh, we have a, um, a little bit of um, poison oak, uh, which is not a true oak or anything like that, but it has uh, margins uh, on the leaves that look like some of our uh, deciduous oaks, uh, but this um, is found in the riparian habitats and in the, uh, the um, north facing slopes, which would be a, kind of in the oak woodland type habitat. Uh, it does produce uh, some resins in there that do cause uh, a dermatitis uh, that can be very uh, aggravating, causes itching and blistering uh, and um, things like that. So both uh, uh, myself and Dr. Collins, who's filming this video, are, are very sensitive to poison oak. Um, off in the distance, uh, the largest tree in the area is the uh, California sycamore tree, um, and that's uh, Platinus uh, racemosa. And uh, the sycamore trees, uh, you know, have very deep root systems, and, uh, and that is kind of the go-to tree uh, for a riparian habitat. If you see sycamores uh, in an area, you kind of know that you're in a riparian habitat. So they really have large leaves, uh, which are going to transpire a lot more water than some of the other plants that we will uh, see uh, along our walk today. And so they really need to have a lot of uh, moisture available. They are uh, deciduous, uh, and so they will lose their leaves. But uh, now here in the springtime, uh, you'll notice that they have uh, leafed out, uh, and they are um, looking uh, very nice right now before they uh, get their summer anthracnose that tends to happen uh, in this particular um, area in Southern California. Yeah. All right, uh, we're gonna talk about the uh, coast live oak uh, right here. So we have uh, a lot of large specimens here in this riparian habitat. Coast live oak is uh, in the genus Quercus. Uh, Quercus agrifolia is the scientific name. Uh, and these uh, live oaks are um, very much adapted to fire. Uh, they have a extremely thick bark up to an inch thick in many uh, cases in some of these older trees. And so there's not a lot of fuel that grows in the understory of these areas because of all of the shade produced by these oak trees. And so when fires do come through here, uh, they're usually not burning uh, quite as hot as some of the other uh, slope type areas. And so these uh, plants will withstand uh, that um, fire. So the, the outer bark is protective. It doesn't have any type of vascular tissues that are responsible for, you know, bringing up water and things like that. Um, the oak trees are also uh, very important for both um, humans and animals uh, because of the copious amounts of acorns that are produced. So oak trees uh, do produce um, lots of flowers uh, and they also make lots of seed and the seed of an oak tree is called an acorn uh, and these are used uh, by many of the wild animals here squirrels and and there's a, an, a woodpecker here called the acorn woodpecker uh, that you know we might hear uh, that actually uh, you know puts holes in 
trees and telephone poles and actually stores uh, the acorns uh, in these big granaries. Um, but the humans also uh, collected the acorns and they would go down uh, near the streams and kind of grind them up into a flower. So there's a lot of kind of grinding stones uh, in Southern California uh, that were being used by uh, the uh, indigenous peoples. And, uh, and then that uh, flour was used to make, you know, flat bread and things like that. So it was a very important food source. Uh, and so the, they would uh, use uh, the wood also for fuel. Uh, and so, uh, so these oak trees were uh, very important uh, to both the plants and animals of Southern California. All right, uh, this uh, tree right here is, uh, is a willow tree. There are several species of willow. This is in the genus Salix. Uh, and uh, this one's actually in bloom right now. So here's the, the flowers uh, of the willow tree. Uh, the willow tree is a riparian habitat type plant. Uh, and it's actually found, uh, it can tolerate the most water of any of the uh, riparian plants. You, these are very uh, important. Uh, kind of growing along the stream banks uh, in the root systems will kind of uh, prevent uh, a lot of erosion. So they really help maintain the integrity uh, of the stream channel. Um, if these trees do fall over, uh, they can start to form roots, uh, adventitious roots from, uh, from the stems or branches. And so, uh, so a lot of times you'll see these uh, kind of falling over and still uh, be uh, just fine. Um, the willow <coughs> tree does uh, produce a uh, chemical uh, similar to aspirin, and so it was used uh, as kind of a pain reliever for toothaches. You can make a, a poultice uh, of it and, uh, you know, put it on a muscle cramp or something like that. Uh, the wood is also very flexible, and so this particular, uh, you know, th these particular trees were used uh, in basketry. So when you cut the branches, you can kind of bend them into shapes and weave them. And then when they dry, just like kind of a wicker um, chair or something like that, you have a nice sturdy um, basket. So this was a very important plant uh, for uh, the, the first uh, peoples that lived here in, in uh, California. Uh, and so this is a, a highly valuable plant because of its, uh, you know, the chemical nature of it and the fact that the wood is uh, also used uh, to, to make things that, that these um, people need it. Uh, and so this is Salix, a riparian plant. Okay, um, well we're still uh, up here in the riparian habitat, a little bit further up from our, our last stop. And uh, mainly what we want to point out here is the fact that there are a lot of um, plants that are considered invasive species. Uh, these are plants that are non-native, that uh, are typically found uh, up in the landscapes. Uh, this canyon area is surrounded by homes and a lot of these uh, plants kind of escape cultivation uh, and then they start to uh, invade the habitat and they make it less suitable uh, for the animals that uh, you know are native to the area. Many of the birds uh, and things like that uh, are finding it difficult to uh, you know compete or you know with uh, these other plants. They don't uh, they don't really like these non-native plants. And so uh, right here in front of us uh, is a uh, grass that is from South America. This is called pompous grass. Um, behind pompous grass, we have another uh, tree called Brazilian uh, pepper, which is also native to South America. Uh, down here, uh, right in the river, or the stream bed here, is we have a couple of um, Mexican fan palms. Uh, and those are the palms that we uh, typically see uh, lining um, streets and uh, things like that. And these uh, probably got here from birds. Uh, they do produce a small uh, seed and many of the birds are feeding on these seeds and then as they uh, defecate, 
uh, these seeds get dispersed over into this area and these palms grow readily from seed. Uh, we also have a very large um, ash tree uh, growing here in this riparian habitat that is also not a native um, species of tree. Uh, and so this is just kind of showing you uh, what happens when we bring in um, plants from other areas. So we certainly encourage uh, the, you know, the planting and cultivation of native plants, especially for landscape usage. Uh, those are going to use uh, less moisture, less water, uh, because they are adapted to uh, drought conditions. And then we don't have to deal with these um, kind of invasive species. Uh, and so mowing and blowing and blowing your de debris into the gutter, a lot of this, you know, is urban runoff here. Uh, and so a lot of these seeds are just being carried away uh, by, you know, uh, by the by the uh, the gutters and, and storm drains that uh, actually kind of drain into this little habitat here. Okay, uh, this is a, a kind of a close-up view of our California black walnut, uh, and I'm just uh, pointing out the fact that um, these um, walnuts are wind pollinated, and so we have a lot of male flowers hanging down. These are called catkins, and the catkins are going to shed massive amounts of pollen, and uh, the female flowers are actually down here, uh, and you can see these um, the stigma uh, that is going to be receiving the pollen, and then we have the uh, kind of swollen ovary. Uh, and so, so this is uh, very common in uh, many of our trees uh, that are wind pollinated. So these aren't going to have very showy flowers that are going to be attractive to uh, insect pollinators and things like that, but these are making massive amounts of pollen and uh, and they will land on these little stigmas here and then the fruit will form uh, and probably be ripened uh, in the uh, You know in the uh, fall Okay, uh, right now we're kind of out of the uh, riparian habitat, and uh, we are uh, pointing out here a, a nice specimen of scrub oak. Scrub oak is a uh, smaller version, a more drought tolerant version of our coast live oak, uh, and it has much more compact growth, smaller leaves. Uh, it is um, very uh, adapted to these uh, hotter, drier um, conditions. Uh, and it does uh, regrow uh, after a uh, fire. Uh, and so many of the plants uh, in this area are uh, adapted to fire. Uh, we are in an area that is prone to fire and actually benefits from periodic fires. And so the oak tree will uh, grow from uh, the, the crown, which is the, the woody portion at the base of the tree. And so after a fire um, moves through here, if all of the top is burned off, there's enough energy stored in the root system and kind of dormant um, nodes in there that will allow this uh, oak to uh, regrow uh, and become established fairly quickly after a fire. And so, um, so this is one of the plants uh, when we talk about an oak woodland, uh, you know, the, the oak trees are very common and is one of the reasons why we have the name oak woodland uh, due to uh, these uh, different types of oak trees. All right, um, this plant uh, right here is called uh, Toyon. Um, Heteromyles arbutifolia. It's actually uh, a member of the rose family. And, uh, and you'll notice it has uh, red berries on it. And these berries are uh, important for a lot of the birds that certainly over winter here as a food source. Um, but Toyon uh, likes to live uh, in several locations. We'll find it here in both kind of the oak woodlands where there's more shade, but also more exposed here, uh, as you see this one uh, is. Uh, Toyon is also called uh, California holly or Christmas holly. Uh, and so uh, there is a a um, story about the uh, Toyon that uh, Hollywood actually got its name because uh, these plants are very abundant up in the Hollywood Hills and it was misidentified as a holly, uh, which it's not. And, and so uh, people 
thought these were hollies. And so Hollywood got its name supposedly uh, because of this um, particular tree. So this is kind of a small specimen of the tree. They do get, you know, uh, 25 feet or so. Um, and so very important food source for a lot of the birds that live in the area, though. And uh, very uh, kind of rough serrated leaves. Uh, and so these plants have uh, thick waxy cuticles on them and, and they are evergreen. They don't lose their leaves at all. And so uh, so having very thick leaves is an adaptation uh, to drought with these big thick cuticles. Uh, the spiny margins on them, you know, are there to prevent um, browsing of herbivores. Uh, and many of these also rely on um, kind of the June gloom uh, and the coastal fogs that we get here to actually uh, you know, have water or moisture kind of beat up and condense on the leaves uh, and then they'll get a little bit of moisture uh, from that uh, condensation that does drip off uh, around the uh, root system. Uh, so this is Toyon. Uh, right now we're in um, kind of a sunny uh, area and we're going to be uh, heading up this uh, slope here uh, which we'll be talking about the south facing slope. So this area is going to be the driest of the three habitats here in Oak Canyon Nature Center. And so we're looking right now at uh, black sage which is in the genus um, salvia, salvia mellifera. Mellifera uh, means honey uh, and so this does produce um, lots of kind of white flowers uh, that form uh, kind of these little pom-poms and so this is just starting to come into bloom. Uh, it's called black sage but it has white flowers uh, but the old flower uh, stalks that tend to hang around uh, in the summertime kind of give uh, the hills a uh, kind of a dark appearance. Um, so what are the reasons uh, that um, or the black sage is uh, so abundant up here is that it is very much drought adapted. And so there's a couple of strategies that uh, plants um, have in order to survive these dry conditions. And one of them is to avoid drought. So we call them drought avoiders. And so these things look very lush right now because of the recent rains that we've had. And so this is the time when plants are gonna be actively growing and flowering. Uh, and then as the soil starts to dry out, uh, they're gonna start sending uh, all of their sugars down into the root system and store those carbohydrates there and then we're going to notice that the leaves are going to start to dry up and fall off and so one of the more common strategies for plants that live in these arid regions uh, is to go drought deciduous. So we always think of a deciduous tree as losing its leaves in the winter time but we have many plants that uh, lose their leaves uh, when it becomes too dry for them to support um, active growth and photosynthesis. And so this is one of those plants that when you come back here in the summertime, uh, it's going to look uh, a lot different. So you might not even see any foliage or the foliage is going to be dry. Um, and so this is uh, black sage. Uh, this plant right here is called uh, sugar bush. Uh, and this is in the, the uh, genus Rus, Rus ovata. And the ovata refers to these kind of oval leaves. Uh, and as I was just talking about uh, black sage being uh, drought deciduous, so it tends to avoid drought, this is an evergreen. And so this plant doesn't um, lose its foliage. And so it's a drought endurer. It endures these dry um, climates. And you can see that uh, it's just starting to come into flower. So even though it is evergreen all year round, uh, a lot of the plants here uh, their reproductive uh, you know, period is time to uh, the rains. And so we have a lot of plants coming into bloom. You can see uh, the oak tree right behind us with those male catkins again, much like our black walnut had. Uh, but these um, sugar bush plants have a very thick waxy leaf, much like the uh, toyon had. Uh, and one of the ways that it can uh, reduce uh, the amount of sunlight hitting uh, the the uh, foliage and causing uh, more transpiration is it actually can fold up the leaves. And so you'll see these leaves uh, being folded up 
Uh, and so that causes less surface area to be subjected to the sun at any given time. Uh, the flowers do produce a little berry and the berry uh, is used by both uh, people and uh, birds uh, as a food source. The plant uh, right here uh, is uh, wild cucumber. Uh, the scientific name is Mara fabacea, uh, and it is in the melon family. And you'll notice uh, that it's got tendrils here. So tendrils are modified um, leaves or stems uh, that are used for climbing. So this is kind of a vine. It does produce uh, a little kind of melon with lots of spines in it. So it's not kind of an edible cucumber. But wild cucumber is also called man root uh, or mara. Uh, and underneath probably the shade of this um, uh, sugar bush uh, is probably the root system. And the root is a big underground uh, storage for both uh, water and carbohydrates. So this will uh, completely die back uh, during the summertime. And, uh, and you won't even know it's here except for the old you know, vines that have kind of dried up and turned brown here. Uh, but after the spring rains, it will start to grow up, and it grows up into the canopy uh, and using these tendrils uh, to help it climb as it goes to get uh, photosynthesis. So the root is down in the shade of the plant, and then it kind of grows up through this uh, sugar bush here and almost uh, covers it entirely. Uh, and so this is uh, wild cucumber, uh, mara, uh, and sometimes called man root. So the roots can be uh, as, as large as a small person, supposedly. And I've seen pictures of the roots kind of dug up. And they're, they can be this big around in an old specimen. Uh, so man root is one of the common names for wild cucumber. All right, uh, this plant here is um, California sagebrush, Artemisia californica. And uh, sagebrush is one of the plants uh, you know, along with the salvias that uh, we get the coastal sage scrub habitat. It's one of the more abundant plants uh, in our kind of drier areas. Uh, you'll notice some of the um, features that make this plant very uh, drought adapted. Uh, one of the ways is to have very small leaves. So the smaller the leaf, uh, the less water loss. Uh, it also has gray foliage, so it tends to reflect more sunlight, so the leaves don't heat up as well, or as, as uh, rapidly. Uh, and it's also got lots of uh, aromatic compounds in them that make the water less apt to uh, be lost during transpiration. And so these plants are, are very aromatic. They smell kind of similar to sages, kind of pungent. Uh, and because of some of the chemical compounds in here, uh, there is, uh, you know, a belief that there is some uh, repellency effect for insects. And so, uh, so people would uh, put sprigs of this plant down or uh, make a little spray uh, of this um, sagebrush and, and, you know, would say that it would keep fleas away uh, that might bite them while they're um, bedding down for the night. Um, sagebrush is one of the plants that also uh, goes drought deciduous. So in the summertime, you can see some of the older branches here from last year uh, that have basically, you know, dried up foliage. And these are old flower stalks here. Um, but the foliage does dry up and, and fall off. And then in the springtime, uh, it will uh, resume its growth uh, and it will flower. And, um, and so this is uh, Artemisia californica, California sagebrush. Yeah, this is... Um, a prickly pear cactus uh, that is uh, native to California and probably one of the most drought adapted plants um, out here. Um, the prickly pear is in the genus Opuntia uh, and it, there are a lot of uh, uses for this plant, uh, but it's gonna be found uh, in the hottest, driest areas of the uh, coastal sage scrub, south facing slopes. Uh, this one's just starting to come uh, into flower. So these are two little flower buds here. Uh, in a cactus, the spines are actually modified leaves, and these big thick pads are actually uh, modified stems called cladophylls. Um, and so this plant is very much uh, drought adapted. It even has its own type of photosynthesis that it does that kind of is water conserving. Um, the flowers are going to uh, produce a fruit uh, that is edible. It's a very uh, sweet sugary fruit called the tuna. Uh, and you can find those uh, in the markets and also the cactus pad itself, especially the younger ones, 
would be stripped off of the spine uh, and cooked and even sold as uh, nopales. So the, the cactus uh, was uh, utilized uh, very uh, importantly by a lot of the um, indigenous uh, people that uh, called California home back in the early days. And it's still used today as a food source. So again, sometimes we'll actually find uh, wood rat nests up in these um, uh, big patches of cactus. Uh, and so uh, they are going to be very well protected uh, in here. Okay, uh, the, we have two plants right here that we want to show you. Uh, first of all is this kind of orange uh, plant. Sometimes uh, you'll see this uh, called witch's hair. Uh, but this is called dodder, D-O-D-D-E-R. And dodder is a uh, parasitic plant. Uh, dodder has no root system, nor does it have chlorophyll. You can see it's just got these um, orange strands. It is a flowering plant. The, the flowers are tiny white little flowers. And then they produce a sticky seed that are oftentimes picked up and spread around uh, by birds. Uh, but daughter uh, produces, uh, it kind of circles the stems of plants and then it inserts a, uh, you know, tissue uh, into it called a hostoria. And then it will actually feed uh, on the plant um, carbohydrates and also get uh, its moisture uh, from its host plant. Heavy infestations can actually uh, kill a plant and so we typically see daughter uh, in the springtime here after these uh, rainy season when uh, the plants are actively growing uh, and so this is daughter. This particular little patch of daughter is feeding on uh, a plant called buckwheat. Uh, buckwheat is, uh, is called Iriagonum fasciculatum and uh, buckwheat is one of those plants that is very uh, drought adapted uh, it has very, very tiny leaves. So again, the smaller the leaf, uh, the more uh, drought adapted it is because it loses uh, less water through transpiration. Uh, it's got a green uh, upper surface to the leaf uh, and a kind of a light, kind of fuzzy uh, lower surface to the leaf. And these leaves can actually kind of curl uh, as conditions start to dry out. And then uh, if it becomes really dry, uh, these plants will also kind of go uh, drought deciduous. Uh, but this is one of the plants that uh, is going to stay um, actively growing, uh, you know, up well into uh, the summertime, uh, June into July. And, uh, and they can also flower uh, fairly uh, late in the season. But this is going to be uh, the little white uh, flower uh, head that starts to develop on here. And so the flowers are going to be important uh, source uh, for our, um, you know, insects as a food source. Uh, so uh, California buckwheat is going to be found uh, on our hottest, driest slopes. So what we want to do right now is, is kind of talk about uh, this, this phenomenon that we have here uh, in uh, Southern California called the slope effect. And so uh, we have a canyon that kind of runs uh, east to the west. Uh, and so that that uh, east-west uh, kind of canyon uh, has uh, slopes that are either facing towards the north uh, or towards the south. Uh, and so because of the way the uh, sun uh, kind of travels from east to west, um, our slope effect then, uh, the, the south-facing slope, which would be in this direction, is going to be subjected to more sunlight. So it's going to have more intense sun and intense sun almost year round. And so the plants here are going to be more adapted to hot, dry conditions. There's less moisture in the soil. There's less organic matter in the soil because the soil tends to be more dry. On the north facing slope, so this slope is facing towards the north, the sun is striking at more of an angle. So the sunlight is going to be less intense. So the temperatures are going to be cooler, and those cooler temperatures are going to allow for more soil moisture, which is going to allow for larger uh, plants to grow. So the plants on the north-facing slope are going to be less adapted to uh, the drier conditions as the plants on the south-facing slope. So that's a phenomenon called the slope effect. So within a, a football field or two, 
uh, we have very three, uh, you know, kind of three distinct communities. We have the south facing slope in the canyon bottom. We have the riparian habitat. And then as you can see across the way, uh, we have much larger trees, including some of our coast live oaks. Uh, and so that would be the north facing slope. Uh, and so we have three very specific and unique habitats kind of all located within this, the confines of Oak Canyon Nature Center. All right, so this uh, lizard that I've just uh, caught is uh, the western fence lizard. Uh, and so we saw the side blotch lizard uh, a little while ago. Uh, the western fence lizard is uh, common uh, in all over Orange County in Southern California. Uh, this one happens to be a female. Uh, the males usually have uh, blue uh, along either side of the abdomen and a more pronounced um, blue uh, throat on the underside. Uh, and so just like uh, the side blotch lizard, fence lizards uh, are uh, little insectivores. And so they uh, like to hang out on logs and rocks and, and then uh, kind of sprint after uh, insects that happen uh, to land nearby. So very common uh, lizard in Southern California, western fence lizard. Scoloporus occidentalis is the scientific name for this one. Gotcha. All right, so this is a uh, side blotch lizard. Side blotch lizards are very common here in the um, local foothills. Uh, this one uh, gets its name because it has this dark uh, blotch along uh, the side. This one happens to be uh, a male. The males have very bright coloration. Uh, and side blotch lizards are little uh, insectivores. You can see he's got kind of a nice um, green yellowish uh, throat to try to attract the female to uh, and so so these uh, guys are very common out here they can also be food for uh, things like road runners so there are road runners in the area uh, but this is called the side blotch lizard uh, uda is the genus uda stansburiana Um, well, right now we want to point out that this um, kind of pile of twigs here, uh, it's not just a, a random pile of twigs, but it was created by um, a California wood rat, or wood rat. Is it a dusky-footed wood rat now? Yeah. I can't remember what they're calling it. Um, and so the wood rat kind of makes this uh, big pile of twigs, and it lives in there, and it, uh, it is very well protected, all right? So a lot of times... Uh, you know, coyotes might want to try to get in here and eat them, and it's got a lot of entrances that lead to nowhere. Uh, but these guys are very, um, you know, much nocturnal, and so they'll come out and feed and get, uh, get uh, their moisture typically from the food that they eat, uh, and then they'll come back here during the day and, uh, and kind of hide out in their nest. Uh, and so sometimes you'll see a very large nest. These nests are used... Um, over multiple generations, and sometimes in the deserts you can find, uh, you know, uh, nests that have been used for uh, hundreds of years. Uh, and so these uh, little wood rats are food for um, a lot of animals, including, uh, you know, birds of prey and coyotes and bobcats and things like that. So they, they are very well protected uh, in these uh, masses of twigs. Uh, we'll also see some 
uh, you know, that uh, kind of line their um, burrows with uh, some of the aromatic plants that are around here to try to uh, disguise their scent. Sometimes they'll even uh, build a nest in some of our local um, prickly pear cacti and things like that. So they're going to be more protected from um, by having, you know, this kind of spiny uh, protective uh, covering around their nest. So they have uh, a lot of strategies uh, in order to avoid uh, predation. And nocturnal is one of those things, uh, but having this protective nest uh, is another surefire way to prevent animals from um, eating them. So not only do the wood rats uh, nest uh, on the ground, uh, but this one is actually up uh, about, you know, eight feet off the ground. And you'll see them even higher up in the tree canopy. So they, they will uh, form their nest uh, up in these uh, big oak trees. Behind, huh. so so to walk walk and I'll you, huh. we'll get we'll get you walking like a naturalist. Yeah, yeah. Go. I'm, so I'm where are we going? I'm recording. Okay, you're recording. Looks like a nice entrance. So it looks like this one's an active um, nest. Here, let me fix this. All right. All right, we're going to try to catch this lizard for show and tell, uh, but it might not uh, might not happen. I thought it was going to. There we go. But now my noose is. Uh, like a force field around it. This one seems like he's better behaved. Nope. 